Hey friends, welcome back to Tori Led Homestead. Today is Shabbat Prep Day Radio episode number 17. Our family is headed out to Oregon in the morning. We are going to go and visit family for a couple of weeks. So we are in Northwest Arkansas. That's about an 1800 mile trip. <laughs> so we are going to be stopping off on the way um, on Saturday night and on Sunday night to stay in hotels. So we should get to my mom's house Monday early evening sometime and I uh, will be staying for a couple of weeks. So I'm super excited. All of our kids are gonna be able to be there as well as our daughter-in-law and grandson. And some of the family out there have not seen our oldest son since he was 15. No one's yet met his wife and baby. So it is gonna be really fun to just introduce everybody and spend some time with friends and family that we haven't seen in a while, go visit some places that are special to us. So. I will be sure to film some videos to send to you all so you can see some of our special places out in Oregon. And if you guys think of it, if you'd pray for us, we will have three different cars on the road. <laughs> uh, my Two of my sons are taking separate cars and then one son's riding with them. So all three of my adult sons plus my daughter-in-law and grandbaby will be in separate cars. So please pray for us. So today for our Prep Day Radio, I have a couple of different topics. Um, but I first wanted to show you guys a little book. This is called Mother's Heart. It's put out by Daughters of Promise. It's a ministry, um, an Anabaptist ministry that um, has, I don't know, I found them on Instagram. So they have a magazine for a while that's really encouraging. I don't know if they're still publishing a magazine. Um, they have a few things in the shop and they just have a really encouraging Instagram page. But every now and then they do these big... Um, Kind of ministry outreaches and this is the newest one this is a book that is written um is for women who are struggling with infertility and child loss it's called uh, stories of lament and hope in barrenness and pregnancy loss and um i have a story in here that i wrote way back a long time ago it's called hope um i wrote this in 2008 I think um, after losing our first baby let's see does it say in here when I wrote it I guess it doesn't say but um, anyway it was a while ago and so it's just a, a little story that I feel like the father gave me at that time and um, kind of a picture of what um, my baby was you know experiencing in the presence of Yeshua um, since then, my views on what happens to us immediately after death have changed a little bit, so I don't necessarily um, have this picture in my head anymore, but I think it was something that was given to me at a time, at the level of understanding that I had, um, just to comfort me, and I wrote it all down just in a matter of minutes. I was actually working on a paper for a college, and um, I had to write a descriptive essay. And I ended up writing this whole thing just kind of like without really thinking. I, I am not good at descriptive fiction at all. <laughs> I'm too um, black and white. And so I have a hard time um, just describing, you know, scenery and, and using my imagination, I guess. <laughs> but I did write out this whole um, story just fairly quickly and um, through prayer. And so anyway, I've kept it around and share it now and then with women who have lost children and so when this opportunity came up I submitted it and had it published in this book so um, like I said the book is full of stories uh, from women who have experienced infertility as well as child loss some of them I think probably most of them are um, just you know like personal testimony sort of stories but there might be one or two in here that are sort of fictional pictures like mine is um, I do believe I'm the only Torah-following person <laughs> that uh, submitted to this book, so um, that's a nice little addition, right? But if you guys are interested in this book, you can find it on Daughters of Promise website. I will put a link in the description box. You guys can check that out if you want. Um, I have not yet read any of the stories in this book just because it's hard to read that stuff, right? <laughs> and you kind of have to be in the right mindset. and. Lately, I feel like I've just been too busy and distracted to really be able to focus and give um, give attention to the stories in this book as I would like to because each one is precious, right? It's um, heartbreaking and 
possibly beautiful also. And so I just want to be able to give that time. So uh, while I'm on my trip, <laughs> I will read at least one of these stories. And um, I have a, a special experience that I want to share with you guys while I'm on my trip. So you guys find out more about that later. So in that vein, I want to talk a little bit about trusting the Father when things do not go your way. <laughs> and I give a little bit of testimony. So when I was um, first married, I didn't know much about following the Father at all. And um, so I was just kind of winging it. And we had our first baby when I was 20. And I immediately went on to birth control because that's what everybody around me was doing. I just thought it was what you did. And so um, I wasn't very good at staying on it and um, quit shortly into it. And so then we got pregnant with our oldest son, Michael, and had him at 21. And then uh, maybe I was 22. Yeah, I was 22. So Lindsay at 20 and Michael at 22. And then um, again, was like, well, I better get back on the birth control. That's what I'm supposed to do. And I took a pill like one day and then I just felt that it was the wrong thing for me and um, just felt really convicted about it and felt like the father was telling me to, you know, trust him with my family size and not take these birth control pills. And so I um, actually called the doctor to ask if it was okay or to tell him I was getting off of him or something because I was very naive and they're just like, why are you telling this? Whatever. You know, if you're going to get off it, you're going to get pregnant, right? I'm like, oh, I guess. <laughs> Like, so you don't need to tell us this or ask permission. Do what you want. You are an adult. Okay. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, and so from then on, we didn't use any sort of um, birth control. And so we ended up having nine uh, children. We've had 11 pregnancies, but nine of them were healthy, full-grown, um, full-term children. And then we lost one in 2008. I think seven. Like, we lost one in 2007. And then one in 2018. And so for, you know, 13 years, I was having lots of babies and everything was great. And when people would say, don't you know how that happens? Or, hey, when are you going to stop? Or how many kids do you want anyway? I would just say, oh, whatever the father gives us, we're just leaving it up to him. And it was so great and wonderful, right? Because we were leaving it up to God and he was just blessing us left and right. <laughs> And then when I turned 33, I had Brenna, which was our youngest, and then everything stopped. And I stopped having children, and there was nothing I could do. I didn't, like, have children and lose them. I just didn't get pregnant at all. And it's been ten and a half years, and in that time, we just had that one pregnancy that we lost, and other than that, nothing. So I have a strange case of <laughs> being very much able to have children and then going through a long season of infertility, right? Because 33 isn't really a normal age to stop having children if you're not using anything to prevent them, right? And so um, I kind of see both sides of everything. You know, I can't fully relate to a lot of infertile people because I do have children. And so, you know, having never had children and not being able to have them is a completely different level that I, I cannot relate to at all. Um, but I do understand the desire to want more children, not be able to have them. And I do understand the suffering and pain of losing them. So, um, I guess I'm saying a lot to say, um, we need, you know, it's, it's one thing to trust God with everything when everything's going great but then to need to trust God when, with everything when everything is breaking your heart and your life is not going how you planned and you're having to make a plan B <laughs> because you know I thought I'd have 25 kids by now so um that's just kind of a little bit about what I wanted to talk about today um I wrote this next article here in May 2008 it was about nine months after our first miscarriage. So I was thinking about that. That baby would be 15. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> so our first miscarriage was not the only struggle that we were actually dealing with at this time. It was not the only thing that I had to hand over to the father because life was just not going my way uh, in several different ways. Um, 
And so this article that I wrote here was definitely one of those times where you're just like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and pressing on when you just feel like giving up, taking off, hiding out, running away. Um, I just remember feeling so much like I just wanted to give up on everything. And um, I sat down and wrote this article. So I'm going to read it to you guys. It says, Today I received an invitation from the Lord. Lately, I've really been struggling with the loss of our baby seven months ago. I've been desperately running after many different distractions as I've been trying to find a way to bury this pain and disappointment. Today, as I visited with God's angel in the form of a special friend, I came to realize that I've been running from the very thing that would heal me, the grace of Jesus. I have so many questions for God. I want him to explain this to me. I want to know why he would give us a baby if he knew he was going to take it away. For years, I've believed that he was the giver of good things. So if he is the author of life, it would seem that this miscarriage was completely under God's control. It would seem that he knew about it before it ever happened. You'd think maybe he'd know how much it would hurt me and how much I grieve and how it would turn my entire world upside down. For years, I believed that God loved me, that he wanted the very best for me, that he only wanted good for me, and now this. But the truth I've realized tonight is that losing that baby was not the defining moment in my relationship with God. It was not a punishment from him. He did not intentionally allow my baby to die so he could speak something to me. However, he is intentionally using this heartbreaking situation to speak to me. There's a song that goes, sometimes he calms the storm and other times he calms his child. Just because God allowed my baby to die doesn't mean he willed it to die. He's taking a devastating circumstance and using it for the good in my life. Or at least he's trying to. So here comes my choice. I have the opportunity here to be vulnerable, to give myself wholly to the Holy One. I can surrender this hurt and confusion and disappointment and desperateness and allow God to make something strong and beautiful and workable with it. Is it worth the risk? What would happen if I said no? What if I decided it wasn't worth the risk, that I wanted to make sure I was never hurt again? I could take control over this situation, couldn't I? If I just hardened my heart and stuffed the pain back down, won't it eventually go away? That's what I've been thinking for seven months now but it's still not working. After I got off the phone with this sweet sister today, I drove into town to pick up my husband. On the way, I turned on the CD that he had already had in the player. It was Stephen Curtis Chapman's Speechless. How ironic, I thought. Chapman's family recently lost their young child in a horrible accident. I began to wonder how his faith had been shaken over this terrible death. I thought that surely he must have all kinds of questions for the God that he devoted his life, family, and career to. Then his song, Great Expectations, came on, and I knew the answer. He's grieving, just like me. He's broken and confused and disappointed and feeling like his entire world has been turned upside down, just like me. He has all kinds of questions for this holy God who holds us in his hands. I bet he wonders now and then if God might be punishing him for something. But he and I have something else in common. We both serve and love and are devoted to a God who turns ashes into beauty, a God who gives strength to the weary and grace to the humble, the vulnerable. And deep down we both know that God allowed this, but he did not will it. Me and Chapman, we've received an invitation. We've been invited to believe the unbelievable, to receive the inconceivable, to see beyond our wildest imaginations. So to him and all the rest of you out there who are grieving and confused and heartbroken, let's lift our eyes up and turn our faces to the Lord. Let's allow his grace and love and mercy and peace to wash over us. He will restore our soul and heal our brokenness. So that was the first major heartbreak that I had experienced as an adult, but it definitely wouldn't be the last. I have learned that all of my prayers are answered, but they're not always answered in the way that I want them to be, right? Sometimes we can keep praying and praying and praying and praying for something that the Father has said no to. 
sometimes we experience what we like to call a breakthrough <laughs> and you know our prayer is finally answered in the way we want it to be but many times our prayer is answered the first time we pray it it's just that the answer is no we really do have to believe that he has our best interests at heart when we are serving him We've got to put our faith in something, right? I mean, even atheists have faith. They have faith that there is no God. Even the most negative, you know, faithless person has faith that there's nothing worth having faith in. <laughs> if we're going to put our faith in something, it might as well be something good. I think sometimes we can feel like we, you know, want to walk away from our faith or that we're losing our faith just because things aren't going the way that we think they should be, the way that we've seen them go for other people, um, the way that we just know in our heart that the Father said it was going to go, <laughs> or the biblical example that we've seen. And we just need to be so careful that we don't base our faith on what He does for us, right? On how many prayers that He answers yes to, and how much of our life goes the way we expected it to. That really has nothing to do with the Father's goodness and with him following through on, you know, all of the promises that he said that he would keep towards us. It really does need to be his will, even when that is a difficult will to accept. So when I was going through my blog and found that article I just read to you, I found this other one that I wanted to read as well. This was written in March of 2018. Um, and I called it Psalm 61, the prayer of kings and housewives. <laughs> Our six-year-old daughter, Kinthea Joy, is in the nightmare stage. It's so strange how some of my children have never once woke me, afraid of what's lurking in their darkened bedrooms, while others struggle with nighttime fear for years. I know better than to let a wiggly six-year-old into bed with me. Once she finally gets settled, all hope of sleep for both of us is gone. After she'd wiggled for a good hour or so this morning, I sent her back to bed, telling her I'd turn on the living room lamp and sit in there reading so she didn't have to be afraid. Exhausted as I was, quiet time is hard to find around here, so I decided to read my Bible for a bit. I'm currently following what I call the Blue's Clues method of study. Present time, present time, open up, see what's inside. I read some Second Chronicles and then flipped over to Psalm 61. Faithful God didn't disappoint. Psalm 61, to the chief musician on a stringed instrument, a psalm of David. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Selah. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life, his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So I will sing praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Only God can take the prayer of an ancient Middle Eastern king and make it the prayer of a 21st century American housewife. Matthew Henry, who was a 17th century minister and wrote a commentary of pretty much the entire Bible, uh, he had, there was a little comment from him at the bottom of this page, and it said, The psalm itself is very personal and well adapted for the private devotion of a single individual. <laughs> yes, definitely. I've read this psalm over and over this morning. The first part that struck me was the vows. For you, O God, have heard my vows, and... So I will sing praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Matthew Henry says the vows he's speaking of are the vows he's made to God, to worship him, to sing praises. Reading it the first couple of times, I thought of the other vows King David had made, to his family, to his country, to his people. I thought of the vows I've made to my husband, my family, my friends, the commitments I've made to ministry. All of these are also vows to God. For a believer, a vow made to man is also an implicit vow to God. Oh, don't I need God's strength to perform my daily vows? It's in praising Him that I find that strength. In worshipful obedience, I am empowered to fulfill all my commitments to Him, and with joy to boot. 
The second part of the passage that blessed me was this. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. I don't have a super strong godly heritage on all sides of my family tree, not in recent history anyway. Yet through Christ's sacrifice, he has made it possible for me to have the same inheritance of eternal life as all the other saints throughout history, the same inheritance given to Christ himself. Henry says, Saints are described as fearing the name of God. They are reverent worshipers. They stand in awe of the Lord's authority. They are afraid of offending him. They feel their own nothingness in the sight of the infinite one. To share with such men, to be treated by God with the same favor as he meets out to them, is a matter for endless thanksgiving. What a privilege it is to worship, serve, and obey the Lord. I just thought that was kind of encouraging. I wrote that in 2008. All right, now I'm going to read from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. This is our um, classical literature reading that we're on right now. If you are one who turns it off right before this, then bye. I hope you have a great weekend. Have a great Shabbat, and I will see you soon. For those of you who are sticking around, we are on part two, chapter six. Mr. Collins' triumph in consequence of this invitation was complete. The power of displaying the grandeur of his patroness to his wondering visitors, and of letting them see her civility toward himself and his wife, was exactly what he had wished for, and that an opportunity of doing it should be given so soon was such an instance of Lady Catherine's condescension as he knew not how to admire enough. I confess, said he, that I should not have been at all surprised by her ladyship's asking us on Sunday to drink tea and spend the evening at Rosings. I rather expected from my knowledge of her affability that it would happen. But who could have foreseen such an attention as this? Who could have imagined that we should receive an invitation to dine there? An invitation, moreover, including the whole party, so immediately after your arrival. I am the less surprised at what has happened, replied Sir William, from that knowledge of what the manners of the great really are, which my situation in life has allowed me to acquire. About the court, such instances of elegant breeding are not uncommon. Scarcely anything was talked of the whole day or next morning but their visit to Rosings. Mr. Collins was carefully instructing them in what they were to expect, that the sight of such rooms, so many servants, and so splendid a dinner might not wholly overpower them. When the ladies were separating for the toilet, he said to Elizabeth, Do not make yourself uneasy, my dear cousin, about your apparel. Lady Catherine is far from requiring that elegance of dresseneth which becomes herself and her daughter. I would advise you merely to put on whatever of your clothes is superior to the rest. There is no occasion for anything more. Lady Catherine will not think the worst of you for being simply dressed. She likes to have the distinction of rank preserved. While they were dressing, he came two or three times to their different doors to recommend their being quick, as Lady Catherine very much objected to be kept waiting for her dinner. Such formidable accounts of her ladyship and her manner of living quite frightened Maria Lucas, who had been little used to company, and she looked forward to her introduction at Rosings with as much apprehension as her father had done to his presentation at St. James's. As the weather was fine, they had a pleasant walk of about a half a mile across the park. Every park has its beauty and its prospects, and Elizabeth saw much to be pleased with, though she could not be in such raptures as Mr. Collins expected the scene to inspire, and was but slightly affected by his enumeration of the windows in front of the house, and his relation of what the glazing altogether had originally cost Sir Louis de Beau. When they ascended the steps to the hall, Maria's alarm was every moment increasing, and even Sir William did not look perfectly calm. Elizabeth's courage did not fail her. She had heard nothing of Lady Catherine that spoke her awful from any extraordinary talents or miraculous virtue, and the mere stateliness of money and rank she thought she could witness without trepidation. From the entrance hall, of which Mr. Collins pointed out with a rapturous air, the fine proportion and finished ornaments, they followed the servants through the antechamber to the room where Lady Catherine, her daughter, and Mrs. Jenkinson were sitting. Her ladyship, with great condescension, rose to receive them, and as Mrs. Collins had settled it with her husband that the office of introduction should be hers, it was performed in a proper manner, without any of those apologies and thanks which we, he would have thought necessary. 
In spite of having been at St. James's, Sir William was so completely awed by the grandeur surrounding him that he had but just courage enough to make a very low bow and take his seat without saying a word, and his daughter, frightened almost out of her senses, sat on the edge of her chair, not knowing which way to look. Elizabeth found herself quite equal to the scene and could observe the three ladies before her composedly. Lady Catherine was a tall, large woman with strongly marked features, which might once have been handsome. Her air was not conciliating, nor was her manner of receiving them such as to make her visitors forget their inferior rank. She was not rendered formidable by silence, but whatever she said was spoken in so authoritative a tone as marked her self-importance, and brought Mr. Wickham immediately to Elizabeth's mind, and from the observation of the day altogether she believed Lady Catherine to be exactly what he had represented. When after examining the mother, in whose countenance and deportment she soon found some resemblance of Mr. Darcy, she turned her eyes on the daughter. She could almost have joined in Maria's astonishment at her being so thin and so small. There was neither in figure nor face any likeness between the ladies. Miss de Bourgh was pale and sickly. Her features, though not plain, were insignificant, and she spoke very little, except in a low voice, to Mrs. Jenkinson, in whose appearance there was nothing remarkable, and who was entirely engaged in listening to what she said and placing a screen in the proper direction before her eyes. After sitting a few minutes, they were all sent to one of the windows to admire the view, Mr. Collins attending them to point out its beauties, and Lady Catherine kindly informing them that it was much better worth looking at in the summer. The dinner was exceedingly handsome, and there were all the servants and all the articles of plate which Mr. Collins had promised, and, as he had likewise foretold, he took his seat at the bottom of the table, by her ladyship's desire, and looked as if he felt that life could furnish nothing greater." He carved and ate and praised with delighted alacrity, and every dish was commended first by him, and then by Sir William, who was now enough recovered to echo whatever his son-in-law said, in a manner which Elizabeth wondered Lady Catherine could bear. But Lady Catherine seemed gratified by their excessive admiration, and gave most gracious smiles, especially when any dish on the table proved a novelty to them. The party did not supply much conversation. Elizabeth was ready to speak whenever there was an opening, but she was seated between Charlotte and Miss de Bourgh, the former of whom was engaged in listening to Lady Catherine, and the latter said not a word to her all dinner time. Mrs. Jenkinson was chiefly employed in watching how little Miss de Bourgh ate, pressing her to try some other dish, and fearing she was indisposed. Maria thought speaking out of the question, and the gentleman did nothing but eat and admire. When the ladies returned to the drawing-room, there was little to be done but to hear Lady Catherine talk, which she did without any intermission till coffee came in, delivering her opinion on every subject in so decisive a manner as proved that she was not used to have her judgment controverted. She inquired into Charlotte's domestic concerns familiarly and minutely, and gave her a great deal of advice as to the management of them all told her how everything ought to be regulated in so small a family as hers, and instructed her as to the care of her cows and her poultry. Elizabeth found that nothing was beneath this great lady's attention, which could furnish her with an occasion of dictating to others. In the intervals of her discourse with Mrs. Collins, she addressed a variety of questions to Maria and Elizabeth, but especially to the latter, of whose connections she knew the least, and whom she observed to Mrs. Collins was a very genteel, pretty kind of girl. She asked her at different times how many sisters she had, whether they were older or younger than herself, whether any of them were likely to be married, whether they were handsome, where they had been educated, what carriage her father kept, and what had been her mother's maiden name. Elizabeth felt all the impertinence of her questions, but answered them very composedly. Lady Catherine then observed, "'Your father's estate is entailed on Mr. Collins, I think. For your sake,' turning to Charlotte, "'I'm glad of it.' But otherwise, I see no occasion for entailing estates from the female line. It was not thought necessary in Sir Louis de Bourgh's family. Do you play and sing, Miss Bennet? A little. Oh, then, some time or other we shall be happy to hear you. Our instrument is a capital one, probably superior to... You should try it some day. Do your sisters play and sing? One of them does. Well, why didn't you all learn? You all ought to have learned. The Miss Webbs all play, and their father has not so good an income as yours. Do you draw? No, not at all. What? None of you? Not one. That is very strange, but I suppose you had no opportunity. 
Your mother should have taken you to town every spring for the benefit of masters. My mother would have no objection, but my father hates London. Has your governess left you? We never had any governess. No governess? How was that possible? Five daughters brought up at home without a governess? I've never heard of such a thing. Your mother must have been quite a slave to your education. Elizabeth could hardly help smiling as she assured her that had not been the case. Then who taught you? Who attended you? Without a governess, you must have been neglected. Compared with some families, I believe we were, but such of us as wished to learn never wanted the means. We were always encouraged to read, and had all the masters that were necessary. Those who chose to be idle certainly might. I, no doubt, but that is what a governess will prevent. And if I had known your mother, I should have advised her most strenuously to engage one. I always say that nothing is to be done in education without steady and regular instruction, and nobody but a governess can give it. It is wonderful how many families I have been the means of supplying in that way. I am always glad to get a young person well placed out. Four nieces of Mrs. Jenkinson are most delightfully situated through my means. And it was but the other day that I recommended another young person who was merely accidentally mentioned to me. And the family are quite delighted with her. Mrs. Collins, did I tell you of Lady Metcalfe's calling yesterday to thank me? She finds Miss Pope a treasure. Lady Catherine, said she, you have given me a treasure. Are any of your younger sisters out, Miss Bennet? Yes, ma'am, all. All? What? All five out at once? Very odd. And you only the second? The younger ones out before the elder are married? Your younger sisters must be very young. Yes, my youngest is not sixteen. Perhaps she is full young to be much in company, but really, ma'am, I think it would be very hard upon younger sisters that they should not have their share of society and amusement, just because the older may not have had the means or inclination to marry early. The last-born has as good a right to the pleasures of youth as the first, and to be kept back on such a motive, I think it would not be very kindly, I think it would not be very likely to promote sisterly affection or delicacy of mind. Upon my word, said her ladyship. You give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. Pray, what is your age? With three younger sisters grown up, replied Elizabeth, smiling, your ladyship can hardly expect me to own it. Lady Catherine seemed quite astonished at not receiving a direct answer, and Elizabeth suspected herself to be the first creature who had ever dared to trifle with so much dignified impertinence. You cannot be more than twenty, I am sure, therefore you need not conceal your age. I am not one and twenty. When the gentlemen had joined them and tea was over, the card tables were placed. Lady Catherine, Sir William, and Mr. and Mrs. Collins sat down to quadrille as Miss de Bourg chose to play at casino. The two girls had the honor of assisting Mrs. Jenkinson to make up her party. Their table was superlatively stupid. Scarcely a syllable was uttered that did not relate to the game, except when Mrs. Jenkinson expressed her fears of Miss de Bourg's being too hot or too cold or having too much light or too little light. A great deal more passed at the other table. Lady Catherine was generally speaking, stating the mistakes of the three others or relating some anecdote of herself. Mr. Collins was employed in agreeing to everything her ladyship said, thanking her for every fish he won, and apologizing if he thought he won too many. Sir William did not say much. He was storing his memory with anecdotes and noble names. When Lady Catherine and her daughter had played as long as they chose, the tables were broken up, the carriage was offered to Mrs. Collins, gratefully accepted, and immediately ordered. The party then gathered round the fire to hear Lady Catherine determine what weather they were to have on the morrow. From these instructions they were summoned by the arrival of the coach, and with many speeches of thankfulness on Mr. Collins's side, and as many bows on Sir William's, they departed. As soon as they had driven from the door, Elizabeth was called on by her cousin to give her opinion of all that she had seen at Rosings, which, for Charlotte's sake, she made more favorable than it really was. But her commendation, though costing her some trouble, could by no means satisfy Mr. Collins, and he was very soon obliged to take her ladyship's praise into his own hands. Elizabeth is my kind of no-nonsense person, right? <laughs> don't say it if you don't mean it. All right, friends, I hope you have a beautiful Shabbat. I hope it's a relaxing celebration for you and that you get some time to spend with the Father in His Word and just praising Him and just enjoying this rest day that He gave you. Have a beautiful day. I will see you soon. Bye-bye.